On today's World Inside, the state of the world, according to global leaders and thinkers at the ongoing World Economic Forum. This year's focus, a one-on-one -on -one exchange with the forum's president, Borga Brand. We are in a win-win world and not in a zero-sum uh, world. And what better way to spend a day than talking about philosophy over tea in a beautiful Beijing courtyard. Deep insights on Eastern and Western philosophy from a German scholar, David Bartosz. Here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Insight. I'm Tian Wei. The world now is challenged by immediate crises, the pandemic and geopolitics, just to name a few. However, as the Agenda 2022 meeting hosted by the World Economic Forum suggests, world leaders and all stakeholders should also be able to raise their heads and look into the future. After all, that will help us also to avoid some of the most immediate pitfalls. On that, my exclusive interview with Borge Brande, president of the World Economic Forum. Tell me more about how do you make of the points and the answers China tries to provide for some of the challenges the world is facing today? I saw a very clear red thread from the speech that President Xi Jinping had in Davos in 2017 that uh, was a very important one and the one uh, he delivered uh, also to the Davos uh, community uh, this year. And the red thread is the importance of global cooperation. Global challenges need global solutions. And uh, as uh, the big economy together with uh, the US the so-called G2, uh, the cooperation between the US and China uh, means a lot. And also, um, it was so important when the president underlined the importance that we continue to have um, trade with each other, that uh, we are in a win-win world and not in a zero-sum uh, world, and that we have to collaborate uh, to fight climate change, to fight uh, COVID-19, uh, but also to secure uh, growth and prosperity uh, for the future and strengthen multilateralism. Mm. Uh, what do you think have been the response uh, from those that were attending the conference online? We heard a lot of positive uh, response uh, from our uh, business uh, partners. Uh, and we know that there is also a lot of invest investments uh, in China. And the fact that uh, President Xi Jinping uh, made it clear that China will continue uh, on um, reforms. It will continue uh, to be an open economy and welcome investments, FDIs, but also China will continue uh, to then invest uh, globally. And uh, he also argued strongly against uh, this notion of decoupling. And this is something that uh, business community appreciate a lot, not two uh, systems, but a collaborative one. Of course, there will be areas where big nations do not agree, like the US and China. That's fair enough. But there are areas where they definitely need to collaborate uh, to secure uh, the future of our planet and in the interest of humankind. Over the past few years, particularly during the pandemic, we tend to, I mean the world, tend to look at the immediate crisis and be bogged down by them, which is rightly so because it's unprecedented. However, it is also important to be able to raise our heads and look at the way forward as Agenda 2022 have been advocating. Now, how do you see that is being responded this time? Uh, building resilience. It is like an insurance uh, premium. Um, no one would not uh, have an insurance uh, on your house. Uh, and this is the problem in many areas um, we are dealing with globally. Uh, there is no investment in future resilience. If we had invested 
in be being more prepared for the pandemic, we would have been much better off. And we know, for example, on climate change, the planet is burning, but we're not taking the necessary steps. And the cost of inaction far as exceeds the cost of action. And even in such a situation, we don't see enough steps being taken. So I think uh, in the years to come, we have to focus much more on resilience and investing uh, in being better prepared uh, for also future uh, crises. Uh, we should definitely continue with growth, but we have to make sure that the growth also trickles down, it's more sustainable, and create decent jobs for people. Mm. Uh, however, Borge, some argue many of the issues you talked about are global issues and they could have impact in the long term, of course short term, but still it's too much a luxury to think about them now. Do you agree with them? I think uh, there is no alternative uh, to investing in future resilience. And as I said, if you don't do that, we can see uh, new catastrophes around the corner. With small investments today, we can secure a more prosperous and sustainable future. And I think this was also uh, partly the point uh, in President Xi Jinping's speech, where he also underlined the important uh, way of inclusiveness. It is uh, important that when we see growth, uh, it has uh, to be an inclusive uh, growth that is sustainable, but also uh, uh, is creating uh, decent jobs uh, for people. And I think what China has done uh, in the last years is also to focus more on wealth trickling down. And I think this is something that is also important for other uh, developing countries, but also for the industrialized worlds. It is about the legitimacy of the current system. Mm. Uh, Borge, as you may be very well aware, because you are very rich in your knowledge about China, you've been traveling to China on a yearly basis and uh, sometimes uh, several times every year. Uh, you know China really well. So uh, what do you think are still some of the challenges that China is facing today, uh, even with the fact that China has been well thinking about some of the solutions? Well, thank you so much. I have had the privilege of uh, working closely uh, with China uh, for many years. And then when I was foreign minister of Norway, I also had uh, the opportunity uh, to normalize the relations between China and Norway. It, it is, uh, by the way, it was very much appreciated. For oh, working. thank you so much. When it comes to China uh, today, I think that uh, the focus now on um, uh, more uh, sustainable uh, growth, taking into account also uh, nature and biodiversity is very important. I think China's statement also on uh, net uh, zero by 2060 is a very ambitious one. Also, the export-led growth has probably uh, come to a point where the Chinese leadership rightly is now also focusing more on domestic uh, consumption and also building a stronger home market. I think this uh, is important. I also think that um, China will uh, have to continue to increase its productivity in the years to come, especially uh, looking at the demography. Productivity will then even be more important. And I think uh, implementing uh, the new technologies, being on top of the artificial intelligence, the internet of things and big data. Here, China has made already leapfrogging. I know that the forum has been working on many of these areas that you touched on earlier uh, with China and also with the rest of the world. Uh, congratulations on that, Borge. Having said that, though, uh, I know it is extremely challenging this time to make sure Agenda 2022 happens. Now, it was almost like a last minute to switch from a, a, a in-person a World Economic Forum annual meeting to a meeting that has been challenged by Omicron. I mean, huge challenge by Omicron. How did you make it happen? There were enormous amount of efforts being made at the last minute. Tell me more about that. No, thank you. Uh, I have to admit that, of course, we were disappointed for a couple of days when we realized that we could not go forward with the physical uh, Davos uh, this January. 
Uh, that was also due to the fact that Omicron spread like wildfire, both in Europe, uh, in US and some other places uh, in the world. So we had to put participants' health uh, at the top of the agenda. But of course, we are looking at um, also future opportunities to have a physical meeting. But in January, it was not possible. And then we decided that we had to very fast uh, move into the digital reality again. And last year, we were able to deliver Davos for the first time in a digital way. Uh, we started uh, this week and so far, uh, so good. We have had really important uh, contributions. Um, as already mentioned, we had President Xi Jinping. We also had uh, Secretary General uh, Guterres um, with us. We also had Prime Minister Modi uh, from India. And uh, while we're speaking, uh, Prime Minister uh, Kishida-san of Japan uh, is in a dialogue with our founder and executive chairman, uh, Professor Schwab. So um, we are uh, really rolling uh, based also on the digital um, reality. Mm. Uh, but, you know, just to make sure it would happen and happen on time and the flexibility one organization like yours has to put into it at every minute when it's turning to the other page. That, to many, has been amazing. Of course, uh, many uh, also feel uh, a little bit disappointed, but at the same time, cherish the moment to at least uh, to be able to get it online. No, well, thank you for your kind words. Uh, I'm very thankful to my colleagues at the World Economic Forum that we have been able uh, to go from mainly an organization that had physical events. Of course, we had a lot of content production to an organization that last two years, we had to then uh, just embrace uh, the digital reality and the agility and flexibility among my colleagues uh, is amazing. But of course, um, we have learned from people like yourself and, and, and TV stations because you're very experienced in running this. But for us to recreate some of the community feeling in the digital space, that has been uh, the challenge. Believe me, it's been a challenge for us as well anyway, Jorge. Uh, having said that though, I want to move on to an important issue about the World Economic Forum. You were there five decades ago. I mean, there were, it was born out of very unique circumstances of the world then. And now we are seemingly to move into another very interesting stage of development for the world. Now, how do you see the significance of the World Economic Forum and its ability to move on to acquire new capabilities and qualities in being a bridge. So we feel also a lot of responsibility because uh, as the International Organization for Public-Private Cooperation, we know uh, the power of this uh, cooperation and what we can get done when it comes to climate, when it comes to uh, for example, uh, also environmental standards, governance standards, and also um, to, to build coalitions, for example, on health, on uh, water scarcity. So we will continue that um, track uh, moving forward. We're also about, of course, creating economic growth that is more inclusive. And um, we uh, very much also think that our platform that's a neutral and impartial one uh, is very important in a polarized world because now we see that nations do not speak to each other or they just compete. And we uh, feel very obliged to bring different players together. Mm -hmm. And we think that um, also nations can collaborate and there are areas, there is so much common interest in collaboration that it should happen. You know, climate um, change and greenhouse gases don't, doesn't uh, travel with a passport. And the same with um, COVID-19 and pandemics. Uh, they don't know any kind of border. So the only way to deal with this COVID every, anywhere is COVID everywhere. It shows the importance of coming together and collaborating. And we saw it, for example, in the last hours of COP26 in Glasgow, where um, the Chinese uh, climate envoy, Minister Che, and Secretary Kerry came together and they agreed on important texts in the last minute. I just hope for more um, happenings like this also between the G2 uh, in the years to come. 
uh, agenda 2022 very crucial moment uh, many believe uh, for uh, the world leaders to speak and for the rest of the world to understand what's on their minds uh, besides that there are many other stakeholders but now Borgia, if you look at the world if you look at the year 2022, it's very crucial. China going to have the 20th Party Congress, uh, the U.S. administration coming into power for one year, and you also see other events all taking place in the same year, not to mention unpredicted ones and the pandemic. So with Agenda 2022, what do you think are the most important lower hunting fruits results we should achieve? At the end of the week, you can say we are doing a great job. If we could um, build some additional trust between countries and also mobilize business more uh, to uh, also uh, contribute when it comes to the big challenges of the world, I think we have been uh, successful. But 2022 is not an easy year because it is the year where we should end the pandemic, moving it from a pandemic to becoming something endemic. Then we have to vaccinate uh, the whole global population. And then we are also um, at the sharing uh, cross uh, in the sense that uh, at, at the crossroads uh, when it comes to uh, the economic development, because we have now stimulated the global economy with 14 trillion US dollars. But now we're seeing also inflationary pressure and we see also challenges with the global value chains. So we see prices going up and how to then balance continued stimulus mm -hmm. with uh, taking control of the inflation. And um, also the soaring energy prices is a problem because a lot of people now have increased electricity bills and how to deal with the first energy crisis in a time of a green transition. That's uh, another one that is uh, big. So there is a not enough of... Uh, of uh, challenges ahead. Mm. Borge, uh, despite the fact we have so many challenges, life still needs to go on and we still need to celebrate life. Uh, so we hope that Agenda 2022 will be a great success for the world. Meanwhile, China's Spring Festival or the Lunar New Year is approaching. I know sometimes uh, you were in China during the festival to celebrate with us, but this year, of course, difficult. Uh, I wonder whether there's something you would like to share with your friends in China and beyond. No, I, I wish you uh, a very great uh, spring festival, lunar year. I wish I could be there celebrating with uh, you, but I'm an optimist. I think maybe next year or at least the year after, hopefully we're out of the woods and we can celebrate um, uh, together, because this is such a, a great opportunity for family uh, also to um, then uh, show solidarity uh, with each other. I, I love the Lunar um, New Year and the festival so much that if I hadn't had this busy job, I would even be willing to quarantine 21 days uh, <laughs> to be part of it. But I, I think that's, um, that's probably too much uh, for, for my job, but I wish you a great celebration. Really appreciate uh, Borgay Brande. The same best wishes to you, your family, and our friends at the World Economic Forum. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. My exclusive interview with Borgay Brande, president of the World Economic Forum. This is World Insight with me, Tian Wei. Coming up, what better way to spend a day than talking about philosophy over tea in a beautiful Beijing courtyard? A German scholar, David Bartosz, accompanies us on that trip. Welcome back. This is World Insight with me, Tian Wei. Learning a country's philosophy could be a great gateway of gaining deep understanding with civilizations. That's what David Bartosh told me when I was having tea with him and his friend in the traditional Chinese courtyard that he frequents in Beijing. The German philosophy scholar told me he learned from both Chinese and German masters the big idea behind unity through differences. I love sitting there with him and his friend with all these books around us, listening to chirping birds and watching restless cats purring by. Here's that conversation. I'm so glad to be in this courtyard. It's mm -hmm. nice. The best part about the courtyard is that you have uh, fresh air all the time. 
and especially in the morning you have uh, birds chirping yes. and you have uh, the cats wandering around. around. <laughs> right. There's no wee here. <laughs> <laughs> and we got great tea here. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So you want some tea? Uh, of course. Sure, okay. I thought you would offer, but you didn't. <laughs> 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 A lot of uh, wonderful stuff over here, huh? Yeah, yeah. Mainly cultural heritage, intangible heritage. <laughs> Maybe in the future we need to do more about yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the Hutong culture. Shijia Hutong Museum was my project, oh. Colin Chin. Uh, Colin. He had a sound terminal project. He recorded sound of Hutong twice in my courtyard already. <laughs> here, in this one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So you got to know each other for a long time? So about maybe two years? Yeah, two years. Two or three years. years. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. We, we met from time to time also here. Yeah, I've been invited uh, by Xinyu to uh, cultural gatherings. Yeah, so yeah. sometimes there are friends here in the courtyard. It's very uh, casual, relaxed. And yes. we, we talk about Chinese culture, civilization, mm -hmm. about uh, all the topics. Uh, yeah, that's culture. nice. I see you even has your book. Yes. How good a yeah. friend is that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> This, this was um, uh, my big study, comparative study on um, uh, Wang Yaming okay. and a German philosopher of the 15th century called Nicholas Cousin. So they are almost at the same time. Almost right? of the same time. This is a mm. very. This is the most important thinker of the Ming Dynasty, yeah. and this is the most important thinker of the Renaissance. I know that you gather together with many of your friends here for yes. you know, events related to Chinese traditional culture. Exactly. Friends, uh, Chinese friends, but also foreign friends. Uh, we have met here on a regular basis and we spoke about Chinese culture. There's a revival, right? Yes, yes. About it's, it's curiosity amazing. and interest. Amazing. It's about, amazing. You know, it's what amazing. is going on right, in Chinese right. traditional culture. Right. Particularly when I know that you had been researching about Wang Yangming, mm. which is one of the most well-known figures yes, yes. in China's uh, philosophy, particularly in Neo-Confucianism. Right. Tell me more, and our audience. Wang Yangming uh, is the most important, I would say the most important pre-modern Chinese philosopher of the last 500 years, we might say. He's a Ming Dynasty thinker, very famous, uh, he is very important for Chinese civilization, but we might even say for East Asian civilization as a whole, because he is a reformer in the Confucian tradition. He introduced new methods of self-cultivation, which became very, very important uh, since he has introduced them. The idea in Chinese is zhi xing he yi, so the unity of knowing and acting what is zhi xing he yi, first of all? First, I might have to explain what philosophy at its core, what philosophy is about. And uh, I think philosophy is striving to, for an insight of that which runs through everything and which runs everything. And this is something that cannot be put into words easily. It's not enough just to, to understand the core principle of the world, it's also important to to realize it in action, in everyday life, to, to translate this understanding into our daily habits. And this is actually what Wang Yaming's approach is about. So many other philosophers have explained the world a lot or have, have tried to theorize. And Wang Yaming uh, is putting the finger in right to the problem that it's not enough to theorize it. We have to uh, translate, so to speak, this understanding that we gain in philosophy into real life action and uh, to I enlighten, so to speak, all our activities, all our relationships. Mm -hmm. And uh, for Wang Yaming, it starts with the family. It starts with the relationship of uh, parents and children. The reason why we talk about a philosophy, philosophical issue, yes. is because that we really need it today, as you just said. But to you, um, what kind of door did it open for you when you were in China? Oh, it opened uh, many doors, not just one. Um, I started out as uh, studying Wang Yaming from a comparative perspective. So I studied Wang Yaming uh, against the background of German philosophy tradition. There were two doors. So 
um, because when you do comparative research, the most important thing is to look at the differences, the analytical differences. Right. So to understand both sides better, you have to distinguish the, the core aspects. So, and, and this comparison helped me to get closer to the horizon of Wang Yaming's philosophy uh, and, and the way how it is really meant in the Chinese tradition, not to project my own backgrounds on, on that, on, yeah. on, on this tradition. And on the other hand, it also, looking at Wang Yaming, then also helped me to see other things in my own tradition. So comparing, learning from both sides also helps you to, to preserve and understand better your own uh, first backgrounds. And now I, I would say I have two, at least mm -hmm. two backgrounds. And from there, of course, having uh, two perspectives, two basic fundamental ways of seeing the world uh, is, is much better than having just one opportunity to look at the world and from there you I can... I love that. I love that. Tell me more about these two different fundamental ways of looking at the world. I, especially in the case of German philosophy and Chinese philosophy, uh, the, uh, it's, it's not uh, completely uh, different. There are many, many touching points, as I said before. First of all, the great masters in the German tradition and masters in the Chinese tradition, uh, they reach the same core level of understanding. We might call that the understanding of unity through difference. Mm, I love that. Right in Chinese tradition, you have he or butong, for example, which is an expression of that. Um, but it's much. Shu tu tong gui. Exactly, and in a, a German tradition, Hegel, for example, he, he speaks about the unity of unity and difference. So core or, or Fichte, he talks about uh, the unity through difference, and and the idea goes also back to ancient Greek philosophy. And it's also influenced by Chinese thinking, I, I, I guess, um, or, or, or there is a certain kind of resonance mm -hmm. since uh, also the Age of Enlightenment. Uh, the true uh, way of developing our inborn moral capabilities is to, uh, to understand that uh, actually we are all expressions of the same core principle. At bottom, we are not separate. And, um, Wyoming also emphasizes that our shin forms one, he calls, we might translate it as body, one body mm -hmm. with heaven, earth, and the 10,000 things. It's, so it's not just about, it's not even just about humans, it's also about animal mm -hmm. ethics, so to speak. We could say it's also about uh, protecting the environment. Wyoming uh, speaks about uh, the vulnerability of animals. Mm -hmm. We have to recognize them for being also the same carriers of cosmic life, plants, plant life, and even natural uh, surroundings. Mm. As Leibniz said, we have to ignite one light at the other, right? The I love European, that. European tradition and the Chinese tradition, they have to ignite each other. And it, it, it's actually what they're doing for hundreds of years. Yes. They're already doing it, but we have to become consci more conscious of this, of this and process. And we want to do that ourselves, too. Exactly, in our individual uh, existence. That's, I think that's the starting point. And that's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to know more, search World Insight. Check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei. On behalf of my team, thanks for being with us. Bye -bye.